Tony Northrup with a reality check about the Panasonic S1 and S1R. Yes, I'm here to crap on your dreams. Let's talk about this brand new camera system. I'm actually excited about it, but it has some real drawbacks and there are some real gaps between what Panasonic has promised and what they're delivering. If you want to win a free camera, head to freesdp.com. Yes, we're giving away a Sony a6400. And be sure to subscribe to see our EOS R review. It should be live tomorrow and a video about our current vlogging setup in case you're into video stuff. First, a size comparison. The S1 and S1R share the same body, and it's pretty huge for a mirrorless camera. This is it compared to the popular a7 III. Compare it to the Panasonic G9 with a much smaller sensor, and you'll see it's just a little bit bigger, and it's a little bit bigger than the GH5. I don't mind this at all. I like a big body. I wish the Sony cameras were a little bit bigger. So for me, this is actually a positive. The S1 is a lower megapixel model. It's 24 megapixels, and it's selling for $2,500. The S1R is higher megapixels. It's selling for $3,500. They're using the same structure as the Nikon Z6. NZ7, the A7 III, and A7R III, where they have a less expensive lower megapixel body and a more expensive higher megapixel body. I like this model. I'm a little blown away by the prices. We have to compare these cameras against similarly priced models. And when you go and you price it $700 more than an A7R III, you're really throwing down there, right? Like you'd better really deliver a lot. The same thing with the S1. It's more expensive, $500 more than the extremely popular A7 III. It's more than the Nikon Z6, and yet it has some real drawbacks. They're going to be live on April 4th, 2019. First of all, the, the body, I, I love it. I think I like it better than any of the other competitive mirrorless cameras. It's big. It has four lighted buttons. The EVF is far higher resolution and it's nice and fast. The rear screen is nice and high resolution. It has a bigger battery. The big downside has like a 1970s top LCD. That's something Canon and Nikon have replaced with higher quality versions. It still has that old model, but I'd rather have it than not have it. Like the Sonys don't have it at all. It is full frame but I put a little asterisk there and we'll talk about that in a second. It is hybrid stabilization, which means it has sensor stabilization that can cooperate with the lens stabilization in two out of their three lenses have lens stabilization. So we can work together. They claim five stops of stabilization for the sensor. And then if you use a stabilized lens too, it goes up to five and a half stops. So it doesn't give you much more to use the stabilized lenses. Nine frames per second without autofocus, which like most high-speed shooting scenarios are things you're going to be tracking focus on, like shooting sports. It drops to six frames per second claimed with AFC. But I have a question mark there because almost no cameras deliver the actual claimed number of frames per second. When you start actually shooting sports and counting the number of frames that you get sharp, this requires some testing. I've seen some people testing it already. And because there are no production cameras around, nobody is allowed to actually draw conclusions. We won't see the production cameras for a couple of months. But from what I've seen, it's missing focus quite a bit. And that's because it lacks phase detect autofocus, which is a real bummer and one that could be um, could just prevent most people from buying this camera. We'll talk about that more in a second too. There's two card slots. Take that Canon and Nikon, an XQD card and an SD card slot and it will record video and stills to both cards simultaneously. The X-T3 does 4K at 60 frames per second like these cameras do, but the X-T3 only records video to one card slot. So in that way, it's making it fairly unique. The A7 III, Z6, Z7, they cannot record at 4K and 60 frames per second at all. But the XQD card slot is really expensive. We generally use 256 gig cards because we hate to run out of space. A 256 gig XQD is $450 for the memory card. And you probably want a couple of them. The SD cards at that same capacity level are only $65. Now they're slower, but you're paying a real premium to fill up that slot. You don't, maybe you don't need such a big card. It won't be so expensive. It has USB-C and it charges via USB-C. This is pretty common. Um, only the Canon uh, doesn't charge via USB-C. So as I mentioned, it has 4K at 60 frames per second and 1080 at 180 frames per second. But both of those get big asterisks because they both have real flaws that aren't super clear unless you really dig into the details. It has a full-sized HDMI port. And if you ever use a field monitor or recorder, you really appreciate that because micro and mini HDMI will come loose and ruin your whole shot. We hate those little HDMI cables, but I love having the big full one even on the GH5 there. It has support for Panasonic's XLR1, which you can put in the hot shoe and connect proper XLR cables to it. So if you're into that for your audio, that can be a real help. 
the video quality, according to the people who've been shooting with it, are, they're saying that it's on par with other full frame cameras. And we don't expect this to change. There's nothing that's really going to beat physics unless the sensor gets bigger or you slap faster lenses on it, you're not gonna get better video quality out of it. So it's not gonna beat the Z6 or A7 III. It does not have a flip forward screen like the GH5 there that we love so much. It's only a tilting screen. And that's a huge bummer if you're a Panasonic fan, especially because Panasonic is marketing the video on these cameras even more heavily than the stills. The flip forward screen is so useful. And right now, everybody's saying, oh, the vlogger's always asking for a flip forward screen. I don't need every camera to have a flip forward screen. I just want one. I just want one camera with a flip forward screen, good autofocus, and 4K video. And that does not exist and Panasonic didn't give it to me. So I'm a little bummed, but I'm also bummed because they always say, oh, this camera is going to be great for vloggers. And then they don't give me a, for, a flip screen or they put the flip screen in the wrong freaking place. And, and then they'll be like, the manufacturers will be like, oh, those vloggers are so narcissistic. They got to look at themselves, but they always want the vloggers money. They're always trying to sell us a camera. <laughs> the S1 has unlimited recording like the GH5. Unfortunately, the S1R shuts off after 30 minutes. Um, there should be an asterisk next to that too. The S1 will record in H.265, which is nice if your computer can handle it. The S1R does not do that. Now let's go through what Panasonic has claimed in their press release versus the truth. Here's their autofocus claim. It achieves not only the industry's fastest level of focusing speed, but also a tracking performance that is made possible by the adoption of advanced AI technology that accurately recognizes moving target subjects. The reality of it is it's contrast detect autofocus, which is not phase detect autofocus. Here's the difference. CDAF looks at what the sensor is reading. And when you just look at a single still image, you can see these parts of the frame are sharp, these parts are blurry, but you cannot tell which direction you need to go into to get proper focus. You also can't tell how far away out of how far out of focus something is. When you have phase detect, you can see which direction you need to go, and you can also see how far you need to focus. So a phase detect focusing system can instantly lock on to focus and in the right direction. But with contrast detect, you need to kind of move in and out in order to determine which whether you're going the right direction or not. If you go in a in pull focus in a little bit and things get blurrier, then you know you're going in the wrong direction. And to make sure things are really sharp, you're always kind of hunting in and out. That can work okay for still subjects, still photos of still subjects, because it'll lock on pretty quick and that can be fine. It'll be very accurate. But for focusing with on moving subjects with video, you really need that phase detect because otherwise, while you're recording video, the camera is constantly hunting in and out just a little bit. And looking at the video samples from this camera, you will see it. Go watch the reviews, um, like the DP review guys have it. Um, Gordon has it and Gadget has it. And anytime you see them tracking a moving subject, look at the background. You'll see the bokeh just like pulsing in and out. How many people are commenting on how I said bokeh right now? You'll see it pulsing in and out as the camera's trying to hunt focus. And to me, that completely ruins the shot. And it just means, if I'm going to use this camera, I would only be using it in manual focus. The focus tracking in video to me is something I would never try. And that is true of the GH5 also. We absolutely adore the GH5. We use it every single time we have a separate cameraman and we're going to be manually focusing on something. But if we need autofocus and I'm filming myself, it's the Canon EOS R because of the flip screen. And if we need autofocus and I have a cameraman, then it's the Sony A9 or A7 III. And Gadget said that the focusing was slower than the GH5. And that's a bummer. <laughs> I can kind of believe it. After all, it's got a few more pixels and they probably have to work out a new system. But the GH5 autofocus for us was never good enough. Even though we use it all the time, we only use it in manual focus scenarios, never in tracking scenarios. There's also no fast lenses currently. So it's kind of hard to even really test the autofocus because they don't have an 85 F1.4 or a 70 to 200 F2.8 or a 105 F1.4. These like fast lenses that really blur the background and really require proper, precise autofocus. All they have right now are two F4 zooms, a 24 to 105 F4 
and the 7800 f4 and those have fairly deep depth of field so if it's missing focus by a little bit we still wouldn't know and what about their claims of having like artificial intelligence machine learning driven focusing that can find yes it can find people cars birds and it draw boxes around them but that doesn't mean it's locking in focus and when i look at the samples what i see is people walking the boxes around their faces and it's finding their eye but it's not getting it in focus <laughs> And that's incredibly frustrating. We see this a lot with manufacturers. They, they build in these things. Oh, it can now recognize faces and eyes and it draws boxes around them. And then you look at your stills or you look at your video and it doesn't accurately focus. So what is the point? I don't need AI to draw boxes around stuff. Here's another claim about resolution. The Lumix S1R integrates a 47.3 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor, which gives it the industry's highest level of resolution in full frame mirrorless cameras. This is true, but it has only 11% more megapixels than an A7R3 and only 3% more than a Z7. So it's not really something you're really going to notice. It's very close. And in fact, it has 7% fewer megapixels than a 5DSR, which is disqualified because it's a DSLR. But if you wanted megapixels, you could get a 5DSR now with a ton of beautiful Canon glass, and it would be less expensive. And in fact, that's what we use on a regular basis. It has 8% fewer megapixels than the mirrorless GFX 50R, which is only $1,000 more and is actually a medium format camera. So it is, it actually just falls somewhere in the middle of resolution claims. This whole, it's the highest resolution thing ever is a real stretch. They really had to put some qualifiers on that to make that true. But the worst part is there are currently only F4 zooms. And these are kind of consumer oriented zooms. They're way less expensive than the bodies themselves. And if you're dropping $2,500 or $3,600 on a camera, well, you'd probably be normally spending $10,000 on lenses and getting really quality glass, especially with the high res body. Right now, that's simply not an option. I also want to point out it's the focusing accuracy that matters a lot more than the resolution. Because if you have all these pixels, you'll suddenly start to discover that camera shake kicks in, you're missing focus by a little bit, and that means nothing if the focusing accuracy isn't there. Here's another high-res claim. The Lumix SR1 features a high-resolution mode for the first time as, mirror, as a mirrorless full-frame camera to enable 187 megapixel ultra-high precision photo shooting. 187 megapixels! Holy crap! We have 50 megapixel cameras and that number of megapixels is almost unmanageable on multiple levels. Search our channel for high megapixels, and I'll talk about what our experience is with that is. It becomes almost impossible to stabilize it. Even on a tripod, the files are extremely difficult to handle. You are, if you want to get the most out of it, you're limited to just a handful of like really nice prime lenses, like the Sigma primes, art primes that we use none of which actually exists for this camera. I don't know what you'd be trying to get 187 megapixels out on this camera, but it's simply not true. The way it works is by taking eight images. The sensor can move a little bit. Um, so the sensor moves and takes four pictures in the same spot so that you get full color information at each of the red, green, and blue pixels. So four stacked images that give you full color information, but with the exact same original resolution. Then the sensor shifts half a pixel and repeats that process. So what we're doing is we're taking two 47 megapixel pictures and then combining them together. Um, that gives you a 94.6 megapixel picture with full color. It's better than, uh, it's way better than you'll start with. You will see much more detail. That is great. It simply is not a 187 megapixel picture. Now, the files themselves could be 187 megapixels, but you could just make it bigger. You could make it 1,000 megapixels, make it gigapixel, because they're, they're just filling in spaces with not useful information. A good example of this is the Olympus EM1X. It uses the exact same process of stacking eight images. It has a 24 megapixel sensor. It produces, or yeah, well, anyway, it produces 50 megapixel files, so they roughly doubled it. In the previous generation of the camera, they were producing 80 megapixel files, but I talked to the guys at Olympus, and they were like, oh, yeah, we don't, the, we haven't lost any detail. It's just before we were wasting a bunch of space, and now we don't waste space. So Panasonic is 
wasting half the space in these massive files, giving you files that are that much more difficult to process unnecessarily because they want the high res mode to sound better than it actually is. They could squash that down without losing any detail. Here's another high res claim. This magnificently high resolution photo is ideal for landscape photography of stationary subjects using a tripod. So that's part of it. It has to be on a tripod. It can't counteract the movement of your hands. That would be nice, but that's not really possible. But the truth is, it's not at all useful for landscapes. We've tried this over and over and over again. I love high megapixel cameras, but there is always movement in landscapes. And when you're shifting at the half megapixel level, a leaf that moves a little bit in the wind produces really bizarre artifacts. Any water in the frame is going to be moving even a little bit, producing really bizarre artifacts. But not only that, you can be on a heavy tripod on solid land and you'll be amazed the camera will still be moving a little bit. You wouldn't notice it with a normal photo, but once you start trying to precision stack these eight images, you will start to see weird little artifacts. So it's unreliable even when you're on a tripod. And if you want to get one sharp shot, I will usually end up taking four or five shots just to make sure that one turns out because the tiniest, the tiniest imperceptible vibrations will completely ruin the shot. But any real world movement, anytime there's any wind, it's not going to work. So what we found is these, the stacking of images only really works for product photography. And even then it's unreliable. You really need to be on a very heavy tripod on like a concrete floor in a basement. Like we find it doesn't work reliably on the second floor of our house because it turns out the whole house moves a little bit, even if everybody is still, that's how steady it needs to be. So I think in most situations, this is going to be impractical. And that's if you had lenses that could really take advantage of 187 megapixels. Reality is if you want to produce high resolution landscape photos, just take a panorama. Just zoom in a little bit and take four or five or 10 pictures. You can get to gigapixel levels that way. It can handle quite a bit of movement of the leaves and the water. Panorama software is completely free and it works with any camera. So I would completely blow off the 187 megapixel thing. There are just better, more effective ways to get that extra resolution if that's what you want. A video claim. The Lumix S1 comes with a 24.2 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor. It records smooth 4K60 video. Okay, the S1 is a full frame camera and the S1 does record 4K60 video, but it does not record full frame 4K60 video. And that's really important because we love 4K60. We shoot with it whenever we can and that's why we love the GH5. And I would love to get this in a full frame format so that I could take advantage of all my full frame lenses and get the nice qualities that they have. But on the S1, the 4K60 has a 1.5 times crop. While the shooting is normally unlimited, it drops to a 30 minute time limit. So now you're looking at an APS-C size sensor. You're not getting full advantage of the lenses that you do have for it. The S1R has 4K60 and it's just about full width, but it has line skipping, which is going to pretty severely drop the sharpness that you would get out of it, as well as adding a whole bunch more noise than you would normally see because it's simply not using the whole part of the sensor. The S1R with 4K60 is also limited to a 50 minute time limit. And Panasonic is already warning that the cameras might overheat when recording in 4K60. And cameras that might overheat my experience is they often will overheat and at the worst possible moment. So if you can imagine if you had an important production going on and you were filming the whole thing in 4K60 and then suddenly the camera overheats, we, we've had this happen with our Sonys, suddenly everything grinds to a halt. And the cameraman has to be like, sorry guys, I guess we just have to wait for this thing to cool down. And that can completely screw up a production schedule. It needs to be rock solid or it is unusable. And if this is a concern at all, then I would just consider it to be unusable. For what it's worth, 4K60 on our GH5 has been rock solid. We've never had a problem with it. It is 100%. Here's the claim about slow motion. The high-speed video lets user, users record slow motion in full HD at a maximum of 180 frames per second. This is technically true, but 180 eliminate sound. There's no sound and there's no autofocus. So you could indeed use 180 to get some nice slow motion, but 
the lack of autofocus means you're not going to be tracking any moving subjects, and that can be one of the coolest things to get with slow motion. And the lack of sound means that things like syncing multiple cameras becomes um, much more difficult. Um, another point they're bragging about are L HLG photos, which are basically uh, high dynamic range photos, but in a single file that's kind of compressed, not like a raw file. So you can capture more detail in the highlights and shadows. This is the format that we'll use for HDR video. And if you have an HDR TV or monitor and you watch HDR video or even your smartphone, maybe it's really cool. Red Dead Redemption with the HDR is awesome. So I'm excited about that as a format for photos. And I'm glad Panasonic is really the first to do this, but there are serious limitations. Those photos are in 16 by nine, which is a weird format for photos. It also means that they're fairly heavily cropped. You're losing a lot of pixels in those HLG photos. And, uh, but the 16 by nine is okay because pretty much the only place you could view those pictures would be to hook the camera up via HDMI to a TV. I know Panasonic TVs will do it. They kind of are built to work together. I don't know if other TVs will. So these HLG photos, they're actually not practical at the current point in time. You're better off just shooting raw and you'll be able to process those to HLG later if you want to. The lens selection is probably the biggest bummer. It's a new system. Of course, they don't have a lot of lenses, but the reality is you probably don't want to spend so much money on a camera if you can't put good glass on it. The camera does nothing without good glass. You always have to consider the entire ecosystem. There are two Panasonic zooms right now, the $1,300 24 to 105 f4 and the $1,700 uh, 70 to 200 f4. And the bummer thing is Panasonic decided to release the most expensive cameras with like the least expensive consumer grade lenses. They're not even F28 zooms, much less any like interesting lenses like the Canon 50 millimeter F12 or the 20 to 70 F2. Like Canon went high end glass, low end body. Panasonic did the opposite thing. You do have access to the entire Leica L range. And you can see, I put these here. The Leica glass is shockingly expensive because you just, you pay the Leica tax. You know, it was your granddad's favorite camera and therefore they charge you three times more than any other manufacturer would. It's the reality of it. Uh, my slide is stuck. Here are the primes. They also announced a 50 millimeter F1.4 prime at $2,300. What is going on? Nobody actually has this yet. It's going to be released later. But $2,300 is the price of the Canon 50 millimeter F1 II. That is now the best lens we've ever tested. That lens is amazing and it creates a unique look that you can't get anywhere else because of that extra big aperture. This is just a 50 F1 IV. And maybe it's sharp, but it's still not going to give you that unique look that a faster lens could. So why is it $2,300? Like the Canon 50 F1 IV DSLR lens is $350. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know how much sharpness you need, but it would be nice if we had some lower cost lenses or at least some more variety. But again, it's a new system. Those things will come. But for me, I would not want to invest in a new system without some at least cool lenses that I could use. And Leica has a 50 f1.4, but it's $5,300. So you're not really going to get any relief by jumping over to the Leica compatible lenses. There are some adapters right now where you can slap other lenses on from other manufacturers. The flange distance on the S1 and S1R is such that you can't adapt other mirrorless lenses. It's either a little bit longer or the same as Nikon, Canon, and Sony mirrorless systems, but you can adapt DSLR lenses and some adapters exist already, but they uh, work unreliably according to people's testing. So you can't adapt them right now, but nonetheless, this is something that will be fixed, but probably not for six months or 12 months time. I'm sure Metabones will be on it just as soon as they can making this stuff work. And I look forward to that, but the reality is the adapting probably won't be an option for you right now. Here is Panasonic's Lens Roden app. You can see they're only starting out with those three lenses, but later on, they will be adding the 24 to 70 f2.8, 7200 f2.8, and 1600 to 35 f4, and some teleconverters, and then just kind of generically next year, they'll be adding some um, bigger glass. So we look forward to that, and I think I would just suggest everybody just hold out until the more serious glass comes out to match this up. It's hard to start a new system. Panasonic couldn't wait anymore because they had Canon and Nikon launching their systems. Sony and Fuji are running away with the mirrorless world. Panasonic needed to go now or never, but now they're not really ready. So I'm glad to see them staking a claim and we will keep watching them. In the meantime, I wanna suggest an alternative that I think is going to be better in every way, at least for you people shooting video, because a lot of video users are looking at this. 
the GH5, which has been out for a couple of years, and we absolutely adore it. The body is $1,600. Get yourself a Metabone 0.64X. It's $650. The Sigma 18 to 35 F18 with a Canon mount is $645. The Sigma 50 to 100 F18 is $1,100. It comes with a flea free flip screen, so you don't have to get yourself an external monitor and build a rig around it. You can see yourself film, you can flip it forward and show the talent that you're filming, the composition, and all this comes to only $4,000. This is our regular rig that we use all the time. The S1 kit with the two zooms will run you $5,100, so it's already more expensive. But wait, the S1 is full frame, right? Oh, I love that nice bokeh and the low light capability. The GH5 with this kit, with this lens set, will outperform the full frame S1 at 4K60 by long shot. Um, because the S1 has a bit of a crop, the 24 to 105 F4 will behave equivalent to a 36 to 157 F6 lens, and, and the 70 to 200 will become a 105 to 300 F6 lens. This is the full frame equivalent performance of it. But this kit on the GH5, you're looking at f2.3 through most of that range. And then if you take the adapter off or you use the built-in digital teleconverter, you can extend the range of it. And at worst, you'll be at f5. In all situations, when filming in 4K60, the GH5 kit will be outperforming Panasonic's S1 kit. I know you're saying, oh my God, Tony Northup, he's such a shell. Now he's just shilling for Panasonic. Okay, I know. I'm not telling sending you somewhere else. If you don't need great tracking autofocus and you want great video quality, even in low light, Panasonic, we still think it's the best choice. It's just that the new camera doesn't outperform their old camera yet. Once we start to see more glass or once we see a body that can actually do full width 4K60 without the line skipping like the GH5 does, then it could be a different situation. But that's not where we are. Check out our GH5 reviews at these two links, and you can order a GH5 here. And I want to say we love Panasonic. They are our main A-roll cameras. We're just disappointed by this release. I understand Panasonic need to, needed to rush this out. They put a bunch of non-production cameras in reviewers' hands, and it's not going to be out for a couple of months. I do get the urgency, but... I'm here to defend the consumer, the people actually spending money. And there's a lot of hype around these cameras that is not actually delivered. So I wanted to give you the facts and tell just about all of you, just hold out for a little bit. The existing gear that you can readily buy new or use is probably going to outperform it indefinitely. But we will be watching the S1 and S1R and their predecessors, uh, the, the cameras that follow them later uh, to see, because I do think it is a good start. One more time, head to freestp.com to win yourself a camera. Thanks. And if you have follow-up questions, write a comment down below. Bye.